our first scripture reading this morning comes from Isaiah 52 and 53. It's a prophecy you may be familiar with. You can find it on page 613 of the Pew Bibles, or otherwise open up to Isaiah 52, where we're going to pick up with Isaiah's prophecy about the suffering servant, uh, beginning in Isaiah 52, verse 13. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of the dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Then in verses 7 through 10, he begins to lay out uh, this suffering servant being crushed. And we'll pick up in verse 11. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. <laughs> Thanks be to God. Let's now turn over to John 5, where we'll be continuing our series through the Gospel of John that we're calling Witness where each week we look at the wow and the way. Uh, sometimes that means slightly different things, but each week we see a wow and a way. And this week uh, we see that in John 5, verses 1 through 18. So after the healing of the bossy bureaucrat from last week, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. John 5, verse 2. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, Jesus said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I'm going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, take your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath, and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, the man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. They asked him, who is this man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn and there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. 
the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My Father is working until now, and I am working. This is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill Jesus. Because not only was Jesus breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. All that I have read to you and summarized for you is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Oh God, as we consider your scriptures today, help us, Holy Spirit, to experience the love of Jesus and draw us to love him. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, you may be seated. Uh, just so you know, if you're a note-taking type person, there is an outline on the back of your uh, worship guide. But today is going to be slightly odd. But I want to invite you to come along with me anyway. Imagine. C close your eyes for a second if you have to, to imagine Jerusalem. Surrounded by stone buildings and a mixture of uh, stone and dirt roads, early 30s A.D. You yourself are in the normal tunic of the time. It's sort of uncomfortable, but it's not wool. It could be worse. It's late spring, but because of the Mediterranean Sea, the temperature stays fairly temperate. So it's maybe 60 degrees, maybe even in the low 70s. And you are walking just north of the Grand Jewish Temple, you can see the temple not far from you as crowds are making their way in for the festival. You, however, are at the Sheep's Gate, north of the temple. It's a large stone building with a red tiled roof and many uh, columns, large doorways opening into an exposed inner courtyard filled with crowds of people. And in the center, there's uh, pools of red water. It's sort of muddy and icky looking. As the large crowd shoves in uh, all around, these people are obviously ailing from a myriad of disease. The smell of people that have not bathed, that have lo lost control of their bowels and are covered in that because of their diseases, and decaying flesh assault your nose. It makes you a little sick at your stomach. Some of the people are horribly disfigured, frail, emaciated. Moans of pain or discomfort ring out around the courtyard, and any somewhat healthy person like yourself who walks in, beggars are immediately grabbing at them, help me! You're, you're reminded of an old superstition about how these pools, something about if an angel uh, stirs it up and you get in first, there will be healing. You don't remember the superstition exactly, but you do think to yourself, uh, these people could use some healing. As you look around, you notice there's one man that sort of stands out. He seems old, much older than all the rest, and he's very unkempt. His skin is much darker than everyone else's, setting him apart uh, from all of the Roman pagans. He's obviously a Jewish man, and he's set up against a uh, column, and he's got trinkets all around him. He's on his mat, and across the courtyard, another Jew walks in. Again, they both stand out because their skin is so much darker than everyone else's. But this new Jew who has just walked in, he seems healthy. His beard seems more or less trimmed. He's clean, put together, although he's still not an attractive man. He's sort of ugly. And strangest of all, he seems to be a rabbi of some sort. He has the blue shawl over his wool tunic that would set apart a rabbi of the Pharisees. Nonetheless, it strikes you kind of like a, a man in a tux and top hat walking into a hospice of dying people. And so you watch to see what this healthy Jewish man is going to do. The healthy Jewish man walks with purpose around the pool. He's there to see someone in particular. 
You wonder who it could be. He's crossing the crowd, and you quickly realize he's walking straight for the older Jewish man who's propped up against the column. The rabbi walks up and looks at the man. But this is no ordinary look. You sense that it's as though the rabbi can see into the man's very soul. The man looks up at the rabbi, but he doesn't speak. He simply meets the rabbi's gaze, and the rabbi says, Do you want to be healed? And then for the briefest briefest of moments, the rabbi glances at you. He knows you. He sees you. He sees into you. He knows everything you've done. He knows about those hidden things. He knows your very thoughts. And a sense of shame for what he knows about you comes over you at first. Your darkest sins and shame that you've hidden from everyone. But his gaze upon you is not one of shame. It's a gaze of love. He seems as though he wants to fix all of your problems because he loves you so much. That's how much he loves you. But how can he know you? You've never met him before. My friends, if you feel alone, far away, depressed, like no one really knows you, Jesus knows you. Just as he knew Andrew underneath the tree. And because Jesus sees you, as Paul Miller has written, you know love because love begins with looking. There's something special about being seen, something special about being known, because it makes us vulnerable. But when we're seen and loved, when we're seen and loved, known and loved, it's also deeply healing. Jesus sees us in all of our glory and brokenness. He sees our sorrows and our shame, and he looks at us with love. Being seen is what makes marriages, when spouses are able to truly create an emotional safe haven, so special and healing. But even marriage is only a pale picture of the healing Jesus can bring for anyone regardless of marital status, when they discover what it is to be seen, known, and loved by Jesus Christ. But not only does Jesus love us, he shows us what it is to love another and to be an agent of healing. Paul Miller again says, Jesus has shown us how to love, look, feel, and then If we help someone but don't take the time to look at the person and feel what he or she is feeling, our love is cold. And if we look and feel but don't do what we can to help, our love is cheap. Love does both. Jesus loves us and asks us, do you want to be healed? It seems like kind of a ridiculous question. Of course we want to be healed. But he looks. He engages us before he brings the healing. And in asking this question, Jesus shows his love and even respect for the man. But he also gives this man a challenge. Of course I want this healing, you know the man is thinking. But at what cost? Might I have to submit to some authority outside myself for this healing? Submitting to authority is not something we like to do as Americans, as Western people. Might you lose your identity if you no longer had this malady to identify yourself by? Oh, how often people say, hi, my name is... Joe and I am X. They're caught up in that identity. Having a malady becomes their identity. And so to be healed would actually bring them much pain. Back at the pool, 
The rabbis glance at you with so brief, you actually sort of wonder if maybe you imagined it. The rabbi is still looking at the suffering man, and the suffering man answers the rabbi's question with, well, I don't know what it is. Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool. When the water is stirred up, and while I'm going, another steps down before me. And the rabbi just responds without blinking an eye, Egere, which means in Greek, get up. But it's an interesting choice of word, you think to yourself, as it's also a Greek word that could mean be resurrected. Egere, get up, take up your bed, and walk. And without pause, the man's face lights up, and all of a sudden he stands up. There was no flash of light, no dramatic growth that you could see. And yet suddenly it's as though a different man is before you. Not sitting, but standing before you. You're, you're in shock. How could this be? Others in the crowd also look on with you in astonishment. They're pointing. They're beginning to mumble. The man is gathering up his trinkets. He's rolling up his mat. And he begins to walk away. And you're amazed. Who is this man that does such healing? And suddenly some Jews in the crowd yell, Hey! It is Sabbath, and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed and walk. Jeez, calm down, fellas. All right. Actually, you'd sort of forgotten it was the Sabbath yourself. Glad they're not yelling at me. The man answers the Jews in the crowd, Well, the man who healed me, that man said to me, Take up your bed and walk. Surely these Jews recognize their brother Jew as the man that's been there 38 years. Why are they not amazed? There seems to be no recognition at all. They are not amazed. They don't see him. They just interrogate him with self-superiority. Notice we're on a a point in the outline. Self-superiority over the scandal that their religious rules have been violated. They interrogate the man. Who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? The healed man doesn't know. He sort of shrugs. The man who did the healing seems to have left. You yourself are looking around, but this strange rabbi seems to have slipped away. So as you watch this interaction, you think to yourself, man, these Jews are so angry that a healing was done on the Sabbath. You try and think through the Torah, that is the law. I mean, I don't remember any rules about not healing on the Sabbath. I mean, certainly you want want to honor the Sabbath. It's a day of rest, a day of worship, but... If your ox fell into a ditch on the Sabbath, you'd pull it out. I mean, if someone needed help on the Sabbath, you'd help them. What's the big deal? Then, you remember, you've heard about these Jews. They mean well. These men are truly concerned with holiness, with being true to the Lord's law, and you actually really admire their concern to honor the Lord. Holiness, after all, is important to the Lord. Yet this anger over something not stated in the Torah seems very odd to you. And then it hits you. These religion as unbelief elites are more wowed by their self-superiority than by the salvation that has come to the suffering. These religion as unbelief elites are more wowed by their own self-superiority. I'm so holy than by the salvation that has come to the suffering. How often does someone say or do something that offends our sensibilities without actually offending God? I dare say it's more often than we might be comfortable with. We might even come up with reasons that seem to have some connections to the Bible, but You know, you can't really find a command. You can kind of, well, if I make, if I grab this Bible verse and I say it this way without taking the context into account, I can make it mean that. Ooh, but that's not good Bible reading. And yet you take this command you've made up as a sort of standard for whether someone is really following the Lord. Those people don't care about their children or holiness because they send them to public school. Scandalous. Those people don't care about justice, the poor, and race issues because they don't support woke organizations the way I do. I assume you do that head movement. I don't know. 
If you didn't see the head movement, here, this is the head movement. They don't support woke organizations the way I do. And we make whatever our new rule is the standard of whether someone is a real Christian. Now, my friends, there are standards that you have to sort of work for, uh, at that you can't just find a verse for in the Bible, that at times have merit. Situation and context matters. In fact, I have thoughts and even strong feelings about some of these issues I've just picked on. But when we, when I, make extra-biblical standards the standard for whether someone is really committed to the Lord, and then we socially and functionally excommunicate anyone that doesn't do it our way, we commit a form of sacrilege. It's not submission to the Lord, but sacrilege when we create extra-biblical rules and then question people's faithfulness based upon those standards. Later that Sabbath day, you head to the temple. You like that non-transition there? Later that Sabbath day, you head to the temple. And who should be there but the mysterious rabbi? You start to make your way through. You want to talk to this healing man. Maybe he could do something for you. All around you, the noise of animals for sacrifices being sold. You're trying to push for people there for the festival. But as you make your way trying to push through, he seems to see yet someone else and be on a mission. Once again, he somehow moves through the crowd with incredible purpose. And you get near enough to overhear him as he, over, as he walks up to someone and begins to speak. And you realize... He's talking to the man that was healed at the pool. He's here at the temple. The rabbi identifies himself this time by the name Yeshua bar Yosef, Jesus, son of Joseph. Wait, you've heard about this rabbi. He's been gathering crowds and teaching him ways that have been arousing the Pharisees to complain against him. Jesus says to the healed man, See, you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. The man seems taken aback. Scoffing at his healer, he heads off without much conversation. You get it. I mean, this Jesus guy was a little bit abrupt, but I don't know, maybe Jesus was right. Maybe there was sin in the man's life of which he needed to repent. But wow, what a way to confront somebody. And then you stop and you ask yourself, was this man suffering? Because of some sin in his life? You don't know. Maybe. And some of you need to know that your suffering is not. Some of you need to know that your suffering is not because of some specific sin you've committed. As Jesus will make clear in John 9 uh, or in Luke 13, in our broken world, suffering often just happens. Cancer. Crohn's and other calamities are a part of being in this broken world. Now certainly suffering should lead us all to look to Jesus for hope, for healing, and salvation. And hopefully suffering brings you to long all the more for the day of Jesus' return and the final resurrection when suffering will be no more. Oh Lord, let it be soon. And for now, you can take comfort in knowing that in ways you may not necessarily understand, God is in control, yes, even of your suffering. And he does all things for his glory and works all, thing for, all things for good for those who love him. And, and maybe our suffering should lead us to examine ourselves for sin. Certainly, suffering should lead us to grow, to hate sin in general, because sin in general, starting with Adam and Eve and including our own, is what has brought all suffering into the world. But if there's no specific sin related to your suffering, take a breath. Let that guilt go because it's crushing you. But your beating yourself up is not healing you. It's keeping you from God. Sometimes, friends, suffering just happens. And beating yourself up won't heal you, but hurt you. Some of you, however, are bitter at your suffering. But frankly, you did bring your suffering on yourself. 
You are suffering because of sins you've committed, and God is now in his fatherly love. Remember our, remember our call to worship. Your hearts are far from me, but I will do a great thing with you. No one is beyond salvation. But sometimes God does bring suffering upon us in his fatherly love to discipline us. And we need to take the consequences of our sin seriously and allow this discipline to lead us into real repentance and submission, lest something worse happen to you. Strong words. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. How you respond to words like that, with submission or selling out, depends on who you believe you're talking to. Now, as you watch the healed man stalk off, you can't help but think to yourself, wow, he loves the healing he got, but he sure doesn't seem to care much for this healer. For that matter, what makes this healer so special? The healed man heads off, and before long, the, you recognize even more people from the pool at Bethesda. The Jews that were so angry come marching into the temple, and they march right up to Jesus, and you realize that healed man went and told the Jews who had healed him. They answered his question, even though they wanted to kill him. The healed man sold Jesus out. He did not submit, but sold out. The healed man was wowed by the one who healed him, but he didn't love and follow as the way the one who healed him. He doesn't see the healer as some special authority. He's not ready to submit to the one who healed him. Healed, great, submission, no. Why would I submit to him? Why would we submit to some Jewish rabbi who lived 2,000 years ago? Well, as the Jews march up and confront Jesus about his healing on the Sabbath, Jesus just simply answers, my father is working until now, and I am working. The Jews are taken back, and so are you. This Jesus called God his own father, making himself equal with God. This is either sacrilege or Jesus is Savior. If this Jesus is truly a healer, then being wowed by his miracles is good. But if his claims about being equal with God are true, there is a greater demand. We owe him submission. We cannot merely love the healing. We must love the healer and follow him as the way. It's the only logical thing to do. And so you ask yourself, if this man healed me, would I love him? Are you looking to get God to do what you want? Or are you practicing Christianity because you know Jesus is the only way you can have God? Are you looking for the wow? Or are you ready to do whatever he demands, submit to whatever he demands to follow him as the way? Friends, the story I've tried to bring you into John 5 uh, today is a true story from nearly 2,000 years ago. One day, this man, Jesus of Nazareth, walked up to a man beyond healing and did the impossible. Now today, I've tried to use a narrative way to bring you into this story so that you could feel like you were really there. But don't be fooled. This is no fictional account. This story I've read and walked you through today, including the miracles, is historical fact. I get it. I used to feel this way too. Miracles can bring up a lot of questions and doubts. And I would love to meet with you and talk about the historiographical reasons to believe that the events recorded here truly and really, not merely allegorically or mythically, but in reality, really happened. I would love to help you with your faith. If you find yourself doubting, I will not be ashamed of your doubt. You don't need to be ashamed of your doubt. But we do need to talk about it. In doing this healing that we believe he did, Jesus made it known to the world that he is the great healer. The one who made everything has now entered into the world to heal his own broken creation. 
And by healing on Sabbath, Jesus was doing signs of recreation, communicating that Jesus is not only God who made all, Jesus is the God who is in charge of all and will heal all. And when the religious establishment of the day found themselves aghast that someone would claim to be God and break their religious rules, Jesus unapologetically said that God is exactly who he is, and only he makes the rules. It's time to let go of their own sacrilegious ways that look so holy, and instead decide if Jesus is sacrilegious or Savior. As C.S. Lewis has commented, I am trying here, and I say this to you today, I am trying here today to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people so often say about Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is one thing we must not say. Either Jesus was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God, but let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about Jesus being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. Jesus did not not intend to. And so it seems obvious to me that he was neither a lunatic nor a liar, and consequently, However strange or terrifying or unlikely these stories may seem, we must accept the view that Jesus was and is God. We must decide. One, come back into the story with me. One Passover's Eve, just a couple of years later, you notice a crowd gathering just north of Jerusalem at the hill called Golgotha. You have nothing better to do that day, So you make your way up, uh, and you see a crowd of Roman soldiers setting up three crosses. Must be criminals, you think. Ordinary enough. But then you notice on the center cross, wait a minute, it's the healer. Jesus, he's on the cross. The healer from the Pool of Bethesda, the one who claimed to be God. (laughs) Guess they got him figured out. I guess he was a lunatic or a liar. But you watch and you listen. He seems in agony. He's been beaten horribly. What did he do? He's been whipped, and the crowd is especially worked up about him. In particular, there's a crowd of women weeping. How odd to be weeping over a criminal. Strangely, though Jesus is obviously suffering, he nonetheless keeps periodically talking to at least one of the men being crucified next to him, and then he prays. Wow, that doesn't seem like a liar praying on the cross. You can hear him call out, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And then, once again, this Jesus looks at you. He sees you. And even there in his suffering upon the cross, he loves you. After he dies, you keep being nagged by an old prophecy from Isaiah. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. (laughs) You go home, it was a Friday afternoon, you have a peaceful Sabbath, although your thoughts do constantly go to your own guilts and needs. You wish the Messiah would come. It would be wonderful if that suffering servant would make his way in and carry your sorrows. Could that man really be who he claimed to be? Could he really offer salvation from sin, shame, and suffering? He certainly did some amazing miracles, but you just don't know. You doubt. Sunday, early in the day near sunrise, you hear a commotion in the streets. He is risen, some women are shouting. You already know who they're talking about. His acts were more than just some cheap wows. This Jesus is the way. He's proven it. 
Jesus is no sacrilegious charlatan. He is sure enough Savior, and he's proved it by really doing miracles and really rising from the dead. The forgiveness of sins you know you need, the cleansing from shame you're longing for, the hope for healing from what you've been through comes from him alone. Many people have been wowed by his acts, but you know you must submit to him as the way because he loves you. He died on the cross for you. He rose again from the dead to prove he is the Savior who brings healing into our lives. And so, my friends, today, if you will, that is good news to help you on the way. Let's pray. Oh, God, you have prepared for those (coughs) who love you such good gifts as surpass our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love towards you that we, loving you and submitting to you in all things and above all things, may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire. Where we have suffering beyond understanding, give us patience for you and help us believe in the resurrection. We believe, but help our unbelief that where you don't heal us in this life, we would have a sure and steady hope of the healing yet to come so that we may have power to love you and to see and love others, especially the suffering. We ask this all through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who lives and reigns with you, our Father, and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.